Let's talk about Dragon Age 2. As a starting point, I think it's worth talking about how this project even came to be. So if you've been following me, you know that EA finished buying Bioware from uh, VG Partners and that deal closed in 2008, pretty shortly before Dragon Age Origin shipped. Bioware was bought at the same time as Pandemic. These were the two video game acquisitions that VG Partners had made and they bought the set. They bought Bioware and Pandemic together. And at the time, it seemed pretty clear to me that the primary reason that EA wanted Bioware was to get Star Wars The Old Republic. This was at the height of when everyone believed that MMOs were the future and everyone was looking for something that would be competitive with World of Warcraft that was going to be a top tier MMO and it looked like Star Wars The Old Republic was a good chance for that to happen. SOTOR was supposed to ship in 2009 originally Shortly after the acquisition, it had moved. And shortly after Dragon Age Orden shipped, Star Wars The Old Republic actually moved again. It was supposed to ship in fiscal 11, which would have been sometime in 2010 or in 2011, the first three months of 2011, and it actually shifted again. So EA is kind of ticked off about this. They feel like they've bought this big property and it just keeps sliding into the future over and over again. And they came to Bioware and basically said, you gotta plug this hole. You were gonna ship a game in fiscal 11, so do it. This is this conversation is happening in late 2009. So Dragon Age Origins has just shipped, done well, and it's December. 2009 and Bioware's looking for something to ship. And this is where I basically took all the leaders on Dragon Age into a room and we went in and all got tattoos and came out and said, okay, yeah, we're going to do this game to plug the hole left by Star Wars The Old Republic moving. In retrospect, you always can look back at these things and ask this question, how real was the threat imposed by the mandate coming down to find a revenue plug. And honestly, I have no idea. And that's the unfortunate thing is when you are in the moment, all of these dates, all of these threats, all of these requirements seem so real, so insurmountable. But then from the other side, maybe don't seem quite so bad as they did in the moment. But I do think this one was pretty bad. I do think that EA was pretty mad at Bioware for not having shipped Star Wars The Old Republic. And if we hadn't put something in as a plug, I suspect that there would have been pressure for cost control coming down from above. I can't prove that, I don't know for sure but that is just my feeling. So that's why this project existed at all. We actually had different plans for Dragon Age 2. Plans that look an awful lot like what became Dragon Age Inquisition. As Revolver was shut down, myself, Mike Laidlaw, Matt Goldman came off of that project onto Dragon Age, but we kind of weren't on Dragon Age Origins at first. We were working on a sequel, the initial concepts of it. But this was a big game, so you're not gonna do that game in, what, 12 months, because you just don't have the time. It's just too ambitious. And this brings us to something that I push back on, but I, let me see if I can unpack this. Was Dragon Age 2 built out of an expansion pack? So I've gone back and forth with David Gator on Twitter on this, and here's basically where I landed. It's late 2009, Awakenings was mostly done, but not actually done. There was preliminary work being done on another expansion, the expansion that would have followed Awakenings. Now, obviously, if we're doing Dragon Age 2, we're not doing that expansion. So that work does get rolled into what becomes Dragon Age 2. It becomes the seed crystal that Dragon Age 2 forms around. So in the strictest definition, Dragon Age 2 is in fact built out of an expansion pack. But the reason why I'm uncomfortable with that language, the reason why I push back on it so much, is I feel like that language is used often to minimize the accomplishment that is Dragon Age 2. Because it's often framed in this way, or at least this is what I feel, 
It's often framed as, sure, Dragon Age 2 was made conception to on the shelves in less than 15 months, but you know, it was built out of an expansion pack, implying that there's a ton of work that was being, that had been done beforehand, and so you shouldn't be quite so excited or impressed by what was accomplished in those 15 months. And I feel like that framing is incredibly inaccurate. Sure, there was preliminary work, there was some trailblazing that had been done on an expansion pack, but there were no assets that were created. There were, there were no levels. I guess if you want to be perfectly accurate, you could say maybe it wasn't a perfect standing start Maybe the, the team was crawling forward slightly, but I just feel that Dragon Age 2 was built out of an expansion pack is used as a, an excuse or a reason or a diminishment of what that team accomplished in shipping a game of that scope and quality in that limited length of time. If you look at the history of Bioware book, you can see that David Gator talks about an expansion pack, about this being worked on and then EA saying, we don't really want this because expansion packs don't really sell, so why don't we uplift it into a full-fledged sequel? So why is there this disconnect to what David Gator is saying and what I'm saying? I would argue it's all about altitude. So David in late 2009 is hard at work on the expansion pack, doing all that trailblazing, figuring out how this expansion pack can be awesome and getting the work started. Meanwhile, at the same exact time, pretty much, I've got a gun to my head to try to find a revenue plug left by Star Wars The Republic moving. He is seeing that the work he's been doing for this time is getting thrown out and repurposed. So who's right here? The reality is, is that we're both right. There was an expansion pack, and expansion packs weren't really liked at EA. They were seen as sort of a vestige of a past form of business. And there was this demand for a revenue plug on Bioware, a demand that came with a lot of threats, implied and otherwise. So all of these things sort of combine to become the birth of Dragon Age 2. Depending on how high up within an organization you are, you are going to see things very differently. You're going to see we needed a full-fledged project to plug the hole that we are being asked to plug. Or we were working on an expansion pack that was completely doable in the time that we had, and now it's be, we're being told that they don't want that, and it needs to be turned into something else. Both of these things can be true at the same time, depending on where within the organization you are sitting. Of course, if we are talking about Dragon Age 2, we do have to talk about the name. Dragon Age Origins is Dragon Age colon Origins. Dragon Age Inquisition is Dragon Age colon Inquisition. Why is Dragon Age 2 Dragon Age 2, no subtitle, and a number? Originally, the plan, the team's plan, was to call this game Dragon Age Exodus. I think it fits the game that actually came into being. It very much fits the project as a whole. And I actually fundamentally believe that it would have helped the project find its audience better as well. Dragon Age 2 is implying that this is a direct sequel to Dragon Age Origins. And that implication carries a lot of incorrect weight with it, that you should expect a game of about the same size. You should expect a game of the same kinds of choices and the same kind of combat and the same kind of art direction. And none of those things are accurate, nor were they ever supposed to be accurate. Even if Dragon Age 2 had never existed, the sequel to Dragon Age Origins still would have been different. This was always the intention. So that 2 is causing an anchor bias in people that causes disappointment that is, in some cases, unjustified. It's causing people to look for something that isn't delivered in the final game because it's implying something that's inaccurate to the title itself. Now, does that mean that if we had called this game Dragon Age Exodus, that it would have sold 9 million copies and been Game of the Year? 
no, I don't think it fixes everything. The game still is flawed due to its rapid execution. But I do think it would have helped set expectations better than what we did. So why is it called Dragon Age 2 at all? When we went into the Gate 2 meeting, the vision meeting for Dragon Age 2, which as far as I can remember is the only gate we actually did for this project. When we did that meeting, we presented it as Dragon Age Exodus and the executive at the time basically said, you gotta call it Dragon Age 2. If you call it Dragon Age 2, it's gonna sell better. It's going to be received better. It's gonna fix everything. It'll probably cure cancer. It's a miracle, call it Dragon Age 2. And you know, going back to Whose feedback do you have to listen to? Very senior person told you it's gonna be called Dragon Age 2. It's called Dragon Age 2. They were wrong, but sometimes, you know, the executive sets things and that's what you're stuck with. Dragon Age 2 uses a frame narrative. It's set within this frame of Cassandra interviewing Varric, trying to find Hawk. And I love frame narratives. The frame allows Dragon Age 2 to have what I would consider to be the punchiest opening of any Dragon Age game that's yet been in existence, where it's able to drop right into the action with high-powered abilities and get things going and buzzing right away. And then, using the frame, pull back and then recontextualize what's going on. I love unreliable narrators in general. Dragon Age uses unreliable narrators for everything. The reason I love unreliable narrators is that it allows you to present information through the lens of someone who could be wrong or intentionally misleading. Brother Jimmy TV says is the way that most lore in Dragon Age Origins is presented. And what that allows you to do is have him be wrong, mislead the player on purpose, or sometimes just give yourself the flexibility to change your mind in order to change the lore, change the universe around that established lore without actually violating it because it's an unreliable narrator. But the cool thing is you actually get all of that while also deepening the sense of your setting being lived in by real human beings. When information is presented by an unreliable narrator, it's presented by a person within the setting. It's not just sterile information dumped into a codex. It comes with this implication of story and life that doesn't come from other ways of presenting information. To my mind, it's actually win-win across the board. It gives you extra flexibility while also making the setting feel more alive. A framed narrative takes it even further. This is a story that somebody else is telling that you're reliving, replaying. The classic one that probably everyone knows is Princess Bride. That's the classic frame narrative movie. Frame narratives I really like, but they, they aren't without problems. One problem that I know that some people encounter with a frame narrative is they run the risk of sucking some of the tension out of the experience within the frame. Because if the narrator is telling this story, then things must have turned out okay, right? Dragon Age 2 tries to get around that a little bit because it's Varric telling the story, not Hawk. So maybe Hawk died, you're not sure. But that is always a risk when you do a frame narrative. So one little random thing from the frame I'm gonna bring up two images, one from the over the top part of the framing and the second from when Varric isn't exaggerating quite so much. And yes, if you notice, we actually dramatically changed Bethany's cup size between the two of those. Is that incredibly juvenile? Yes, it's incredibly juvenile. Varric, in my defense, is also pretty juvenile, at least at this point in Dragon Age 2. Is this something that I would do now? No. I don't think it really accomplishes anything. I don't think it helps to establish Varric's character any better, which is really the only arguable reason to do it. I actually think most people don't even notice that it's happening. But now you know. If you didn't notice yourself, now you know. But the frame narrative did allow us to do one major thing, which allowed us to control scope massively on this project, which was the time jumps. Rather than being a story told over space, Dragon Age 2 is a story told over time. So it takes place in Kirkwall 
over the course of a number of years. And then with the framed narrator, with the framed narrative, you're able to jump forward as required to move the story forward. This allows you to get more storytelling done, but use the same areas several times. And we'll talk about area reuse in a little bit. In terms of reusing Kirkwall, this is a very effective way to allow most of the story to take place within that one city. That allowed us to control level art scope quite a bit. One thing that I think that wasn't done super effectively on Dragon Age 2 was having really peelable scope. Peelable scope means that you build the structure of your game in such a way that you know the places where you're going to shrink and cut and squeeze if you're if you need to cut scope or control scope or change the size of your game. And honestly, it can work both ways. If you have a really well-designed peelable scope, it allows you to expand the game as well because it gives those expansion points. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it means that when you are having to compress, you've already had the conversation, you've already built it into the plan. You've built in different places that can grow or shrink. In the case of Dragon Age 2, in part because it was so rushed to just get going, there really isn't a great peelable scope plan. There were some attempts at it, but in the end, basically everything that was conceived was conceived as necessary as a linchpin. What ends up happening when you have a plan like that is everything that can be cut ends up getting cut right away and then everything else is load-bearing and you end up having to sort of squeeze every individual piece of the game in order to find your savings, which isn't the most effective way to find savings and it usually also isn't the highest quality way to find those savings either. I remember specifically when we were doing story reviews for Act 1. So Act 1, you have to get enough money to go on the expedition to the Deep Roads part. And the idea the idea of this section was supposed to be, let's make it be this gather enough resources meta plot so that we can grow or shrink the plots required as much as we need to in order to fit in the scope that we required. Harkening back to the almost exactly same plot from Baldur's Gate 2, where you have to get enough money. I don't remember why you're getting enough money. You have to get 10,000 gold in Baldur's Gate 2, but I'm not sure why. But the problem is that in the time between Baldur's Gate 2 and Dragon Age 2, the narrative intricacies had gone up immensely. So Act 1, which should have been, for scope reasons, just a single lighthouse in the darkness saying, get enough money so that you can go on this expedition, also ended up having a bunch of other plots that were establishing characters or establishing situations that would come back in the subsequent acts. And I remember looking at this on the wall and saying to Mike Laidlaw, there's too much story here. It's going to be too big. You know, it's always hard to tell how much story you've got. So the answer was, no, 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 it's fine. We've got this under control. And the reality is, is, is no, they, they didn't have it under control. We ended up effectively cutting everything except for these narratively necessary beats of introducing characters, introducing situations. So effectively that lighthouse plot, get enough resources to go on the expedition, ended up being kind of an appendix, kind of a leftover feature, because by doing the critical path must do plots, you got enough resources to do that plot. Everything else was basically gone. So there wasn't this open world or this unbounded, do whatever you want, just get enough resources. It ended up being do these things you have to do, then you'll have enough to go on the resources. It made, the, it made act one way more linear than was intended. Is that kind of open-ended plot even possible with the Bioware style of storytelling? Honestly, I do think that it is. I think that every time you introduce a character or a potential follower, there's a lot of stuff that comes along with that. So there's a limit because act one is also when you're gonna introduce all your characters. But I do believe that it was possible to remove some of that context setting that's in there to allow that act to breathe a little bit more. So as I'm going through this, I'm starting to realize maybe 
why I've struggled with getting peelable scope into the projects that I've led. I think when I use that phrase, peelable scope, you immediately go to some sort of fruit. I think there are two extreme forms of peel. On one hand, and the analogy that I'm going for, unsuccessfully I think, is an onion. An onion in a way is kind of just peels all the way down. It's concentric rings of different layers of onion that go down forever until you've basically run out of onion. If your peelable scope is built like an onion, you can cut and cut and cut and cut. And eventually there's nothing left. You've just cut everything. At no point do you hit something that changes what it is so that peelable scope goes forever. On the other extreme, you have something like an apple. If you peel an apple, the peel is incredibly thin. So by peeling off that outer layer, that peelable scope, you haven't really removed very much at all, have you? So when you are trying to establish peelable scope in your game, when you're building peelable scope in your game, there needs to be enough of it for it to change the conversation about the game overall. If you just have a little bit of peelable scope, what's gonna happen is you're just gonna cut all of that and then you've hit the resistance and there's no more to cut. You might as well just have cut it in the first place because there's so little of it that it's just what gets jettisoned immediately. If you have lots of peelable scope, enough peelable scope, now the conversation is more interesting and you're able to allow the project to breathe bigger and smaller as is possible because there's lots of different places where the scope can change. But I think the mistake that I made is that I don't think this was truly understood, even by myself, that it wasn't just about having some things that you understood that you had the ability to cut. It's about having this philosophy towards the features and content as a whole to allow this growing and shrinking to occur everywhere not just having sacrificial features. Make sure that your core isn't so large that you just end up peeling right up to the core almost at the first instant that you look. Know how the game is going to breathe and get bigger and smaller. Dragon Age 2 is ultimately a game that is about constraints. There's a very limited amount of time, which means there's a very limited amount of time for anything, for assets, for, for levels, for gameplay mechanics, for anything. As a result, I actually think this game shows why constraints are so important. Because you see the team rising to the challenge, working within the tiny box that they have to make the best game that they can. And sometimes constraints aren't fully understood and sometimes one department is doing something that is violating a constraint of a different department and the game doesn't really hold up because maybe we needed a couple more caves and the writing's going to the caves too much or that sort of thing. But you can see where the tiny number of ingredients that are available for this game are for the most part being used to full advantage in order to make something that I think is really good. Here where we're talking about constraints, it's probably worth talking briefly about TatCam. So on PC, Dragon Age Origins has TatCam. On consoles, it actually doesn't. On Dragon Age Inquisition, we have TatCam for all the consoles. On Dragon Age 2, we don't have TatCam at all. And why is that? Well, the primary reason in the case of Dragon Age 2 is about the constraints that are in place on this project. Because making levels that can work both in TatCam and in the standard cam is actually quite expensive. In Dragon Age Origins, the estimate was that it was coming close to doubling the costs of the levels. I don't know if that's fully accurate, but that's what the estimate said. So when you are making a game with this kind of time constraint, you cannot afford to double the costs of your levels. That's just not going to fly. But the other reality is, is that in Dragon Age Origins, consoles were incidental. They were an afterthought. They were added on at the end. And we didn't have a good understanding of how tactical camera would work for the consoles, at least not yet. So again, because of the constraints, it 
didn't make sense to take that burden on on that project. So we set TACCAM aside for that game and then picked it back up again later. I honestly don't think that TACCAM is a core genetic feature of the Dragon Age series. I think that people who consider Dragon Age Origins to be the best Dragon Age might disagree with me, but I think it is not something that defines the series, as opposed to things like teamwork and choices with consequence and power with a price and the other things that I feel really make up what a Dragon Age is. So that's why there's no tack cam in Dragon Age 2. Primary reason that I think Dragon Age 2 is the Dragon Age game that's very fashionable to like now is because it's the first Bioware game that intentionally puts the characters first. I still don't think we've actually said it out loud that it's about the characters stupid, that Bioware's secret sauce is characters and followers that you can have these relationships with. I still don't think that we're really acknowledging it. We're doing it because we have no other choice. Characters are fast to write. Characters, they don't require as many rewrites typically. Characters can often do their plots in whatever level is hanging around. So they are perfect for a highly constrained situation. As you go beyond this game, as you get even past Dragon Age Inquisition, yeah, the reality is, is this is what makes Bioware games special. Characters that are interesting, that have interesting interactions, that have arcs and evolution and wants and needs, that you get to have a story with, that you get to hang out with, that you get to potentially romance. This is the secret of Bioware games. And it's, in retrospect, kind of mind-boggling that it wasn't until a post-Dragon Age Inquisition world that Bioware was really able to say this out loud and say, it's about the characters, stupid. It's always been about the characters, stupid. Why did we allow this to be an incidental feature that was special in spite of the intention that was being paid to it? So I think Dragon Age 2 is the game that shows the way to what made Bioware special in the first place and what continues to hopefully make Bioware special in the future. That's the special thing in Dragon Age 2. Let's talk about the less than special thing. So there are several very valid criticisms of Dragon Age 2. You can criticize it for being too different from Dragon Age Origins, Again, especially because it's Dragon Age 2 and not Dragon Age Exodus. You can criticize it for a much more console-focused combat style. The fact that the Mage Templar dichotomy gets undermined in Act 3 as we force you through the same content is a big one for me. I feel that undermines the story quite a bit. I think those are choices. I think those are defensible. The one that's pretty hard to defend, other than to say... We only had 14 months, so what did you expect? Is the amount of asset reuse and more specifically, how identifiable some of those asset reuse cases are. I believe strongly in asset reuse. I believe games should actually be doing it more than they do it now. In fact, I believe this so much, I made an entire video about that fact. For levels, which is the primary source of criticism, there are, I would argue, three styles of level reuse in Dragon Age 2. And I think two of the three are actually okay. You've got the city, you've got Kirkwall. We are reusing this level. It's the same level. We're telling you it's the same level. We're recontextualizing the situation that you're in. This is now nighttime and you're fighting against some bandits in Hightown. This is six years later and you are in low town and this is happening. I think that is perfectly fine. I don't think there's a lot of criticism there or at least not a lot of criticism that stands the scrutiny it deserves because we're not hiding anything. We're reusing the level. This is the choice we've made. We're telling the story through time as opposed to a story through space. So that's the choice that we made. You may not like it, but it is what it is. The second, which isn't amazing, but I think is acceptable, is the reuse of levels where we're taking something relatively generic and we're reusing it as a different version of a similar but not identical level. So the most widely used example in Dragon Age 2 is the warehouse. You go to the same level, which is a warehouse, some of the paths are blocked off with some boxes or some doors are locked or whatever. It's generic warehouse. 
you go to have generic warehouse adventures and you move on. It's noticeable, especially because the level map wasn't actually able to hide the parts that were masked out in the game. I think if we had been able to do that, probably would have taken, you know, a week or less of additional development time, but we didn't have that. If we'd been able to mask out the levels, I think it would have been even better. But I think it's okay. And why do I think it's okay is because this isn't anything special. It's just generic warehouse number six or number two or number seven. Who cares? It doesn't matter. You play it. It's about the encounter. It's about the experience. It's about the situation. The actual generic warehouse is just there to be a place for this to happen. If we had made custom warehouses for each of these encounters, they honestly wouldn't have looked that much different than what was actually shipped with the game. So yes, it's reuse. Yes, it's not ideal, but it's fine. The third, and it's the one I think that basically sort serves as the kernel of all of the complaints, and I think it is perfectly justifiable, is the cave. Same as the warehouse, we go to the cave several times, it identifies itself as being a different cave every single time. Some things are blocked off in every time you visit it. Sometimes the door is locked or what have you. So why is the cave not okay when the warehouse is okay? And the reason is, and this is, I think, going to sound a little weird, but the reason is, is that cave is too specific. It has too many identifiable landmarks. So it's not just that you can tell the level is being reused, because you can tell the warehouse is being reused as well. It's that it's rubbing your nose in it. You're going through, and then you get to that place where the ceiling is caved in and there's a perfect light beam highlighting some ground and you're like wait a minute that's pretty but i've seen that a few other times and you pretended like it was a different level and because it is so identifiable because it is so high fidelity it isn't acceptable it's not okay and that's really the lesson there is reuse assets all games should be reusing assets but if it is something that you would make a screenshot of, or if it's something that is going to be noteworthy, then you have to be much more careful when you're reusing it. Because what you're potentially doing is you are rubbing people's nose in the fact of that reuse. And that's when it becomes not okay. Matt Goldman, who was the art director on Dragon Age 2 and Dragon Age Inquisition, with Dragon Age 2 was trying very hard to make Dragon Age look like something that was different than the other fantasy games around at the time. I mentioned this in the Dragon Age Origins video. Dragon Age Origins and The Witcher and Dragon's Dogma and a lot of games that are contemporary to that time period actually kind of look very similar to each other, which makes them understandable, which makes them approachable, but it also means that they're not well differentiated from each other. So it can be hard to attract someone into your game if they see a screenshot and they don't necessarily know what game it's even from. Dragon Age 2 just leans into fixing this problem through two things. Very strong art direction. The art direction for Dragon Age 2 could be summed up as a Kurosawa film in the Northern Renaissance, which I'm not a, an artist. I don't have a background in art history either, so I may not be able to fully explain that, but it's about clear use of color and a lot of negative space in the picture making, which definitely means that Dragon Age 2 has a very intentional look to it. The other thing that Dragon Age 2 does, which is important, is it is very cognizant of the limitations of the engine itself. The engine that Dragon Age Origins, Dragon Age 2 is made with is very good at pushing polygons. It's very good at pushing large amounts of mesh, but it's much less good at surface. So the art direction is leaning into polygons and leaning away from, from fancy surface effects. So those two things together, Akira Kurosawa in the Northern Renaissance and Push More Polys, Worry About the Surfaces Less, come together to give us the art direction of Dragon Age 2. I like the art direction of Dragon Age 2. As I said, it looks like something distinct. When you see a screenshot from Dragon Age 2, it definitely looks like something. It's not universally liked, but it does 
look like something. In addition to changing the art direction between Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2, another major shift between the two games was the philosophical approach to combat. I've said this before, but I think it's bears repeating, the underlying technology behind the Dragon Age Origins combat and the Dragon Age 2 combat is basically identical. It uses the same systems. It's just packaged and used in a very different way. Dragon Age Origins is perfectly symmetrical. You have abilities and stamina and hit points and Enemies have abilities, stamina, and hit points. Not only that, the amount of damage you do is exactly the same as the amount of damage that an enemy does. The amount of hit points you have, exactly the same as the number of hit points that an enemy has. Perfectly symmetrical. You can take an enemy from Dragon Age Origins, plug them into your party, they are now a balanced member of your party. This offers some advantages. The main one being exactly that, which is you can have party members become enemies, you can have enemies become allies, and it all just kind of works. But like I mentioned in the Dragon Age Origins video, it has a huge disadvantage, which is that it is very difficult to balance. Because if you can do everything an enemy can do, and they can do everything that you can do, you end up with a lot of problems. If you change the balance of bows right before the game comes up to try to make archery a more viable player choice, you might accidentally unbalance all of the bows in the entire game for the enemies as well and make all of those combats way harder in the final days of your game, which is exactly what happened in Dragon Age Origins. While perfect symmetry sounds on paper like it's a great idea, for me I think it's actually a terrible idea and the problems of it far outweigh the benefits. So Dragon Age 2 flips that on its head and says we're not going to worry about symmetry at all. We're going to make the player have very few hit points and enemies won't do very much damage. The player character will do a ton of damage with their abilities but to compensate enemies will have a ton of hit points as well. So that's cool. It lets you do things like have player abilities that just do a massive amount of damage without having to worry about those coming back and hitting the player. But of course, you lose all those things I talked about with perfect symmetry. Because the discrepancy between an enemy ability and a player ability is so vast, if a party member starts fighting against the party, they do so much damage, they're essentially one-shotting every single person in the party. And similarly, you're one-shotting them. So it's not an interesting combat encounter because the balance between hit points and damage is completely gone. And you can't have enemies joining the party really either. It's less problematic because they do so little damage, but they're not particularly useful because they're just these sacks of hit points that are basically unkillable by any other enemies uh, and they can't do very much that is useful. But the primary thing that I think is off about the combat balance or the numerical philosophy of combat in Dragon Age 2 is it simply that it pushes it too far. Because you can have player characters doing 100,000 points of damage with a single hit, what you've done is you've basically rendered the combat systems completely undiscoverable. They can't be really understood by the player. They know that if they put things here, number go up, bigger number equals better. But because the numbers they're dealing with are so huge, and the math is just so exponential. The ability for a player to understand what's going on is highly diminished. The reality is, is you don't want perfect symmetry, hard to balance, but easy to understand and potentially useful. But you also don't want an extreme asymmetry where you render the systems completely unintelligible. What ended up happening with Dragon Age is going from Dragon Age 2 to Dragon Age Inquisition is the pendulum swung part of the way back. Dragon Age Inquisition's combat systems are not perfectly symmetrical, but they're also not as asymmetrical as DA2. And that middle ground balance allows you to make something that's understandable and puts allies back on the table, at least to some degree. This is similarly where you've seen Dungeons & Dragons go. Third edition D&D, 
perfectly symmetrical. It means that you really understand how combat works. You really understand the abilities being used against you because those abilities are basically mirror images of the abilities you yourself can use. Fourth edition D&D, unbelievably asymmetrical. Players do massive amounts of damage, enough to easily one-shot anyone in their party. And similarly, enemies do a lot less damage, but have a lot more hit points. As a result, the combat is way more balanced, way more resistant to exploitation, but it's actually harder to understand how the systems fit together. So moving from 4th edition to 5th edition D&D, you get something that's in the middle. It's no longer perfectly symmetrical like third edition, but it doesn't have this ridiculous exponential growth and asymmetry that you see in fourth edition. So both Dungeons and Dragons and Dragon Age have followed a similar path. Perfect symmetry, ridiculously extreme asymmetry, finally landing on something in the middle that provides the benefits of both extremes to some degree. So those are the two swing for the fences changes in Dragon Age 2, a completely new art direction and a radical rethinking of the way that combat mathematics were done. So did it make sense to do those two things? I think it's hard. I think the answer is yes, but let me sort of walk through my reasoning behind that. In terms of art direction, sticking with the Dragon Age Origins art direction would have obviously given a lot more opportunity for reuse, potentially alleviating a lot of the level reuse that occurred. But the problem is, is that for a game that didn't have the scale of Dragon Age Origins, having a not very identifiable art direction probably would have been just as bad as having less levels to choose from. For the combat math, I would argue that it was also the right decision to make. While the combat became sort of indecipherable to a large degree, what this heavy asymmetry gave the development team was the ability to balance combat really quickly. Because all the math isn't connected to every other piece of math, if something was unbalanced, you could relatively quickly rebalance that one particular thing without having to worry about the impact it had on every single other thing in the entire game. Hot take, I guess, but my feeling is both the radical change in art direction and the change in the way that we thought about combat, were both the right decision to make for Dragon Age 2. And actually, when you look at both of these things, by making these radical changes, by taking these big swings, it allowed Dragon Age Inquisition to find something that cut the difference between these two games and arrived at something that was better than it otherwise would have been able to. We're building Dragon Age 2. This is a game that is a sprint pretty much from its first moment in early January of 2010 to the moment it gets on shelves in early 2011. And now we are starting up the marketing for Dragon Age 2. EA's always had trouble marketing Bioware games. It knows how to market sports games, but you don't market an RPG the way you market a sports game. Sports games, you market largely through this method. You already like this sport. Yes, yes I do. Well, this game very accurately depicts that sport. And let me tell you about some of the features through which it does that. Oh, that's very interesting. Coming into buying FIFA or Madden or any of these games, you already kind of know if you're open to the concept of buying a soccer game or a football game. So the marketing is specifically trying to sell you this football game or this soccer game. So it does that through talking about features and talking about specifics. But RPGs are different than that because RPGs are so different from one another, from company to company, even from franchise to franchise, that you need to spend a lot more time on a lot more different things. You need to talk about the world. You need to talk about the characters. You need to talk about what the rules of the game are. You don't need to talk about the rules of soccer for your soccer game. People who are going to buy your soccer game already know those. EA has always struggled with marketing Bioware games. On Dragon Age 2, the person that was in charge of our marketing wanted to do a dual target marketing so the idea was this, you would have two 
targets for assets. You would have the Treehouse, who are basically the RPG core, the Bioware core. You're going to go to them with the details and you're going to give them a lot of meat. And then you're going to have the frat house where you are going to give them a lot more sizzle, a lot more punch, a lot more rock and roll trailers. Those of you who have followed marketing on Bioware all the way along will remember push a button and something awesome happens. That is a line that's very much focused at the frat house. Very much saying play Dragon Age 2, the combat is fast and awesome and you're just going to have a fun time. There are a bunch of problems with this dual targeted marketing. I mean, right off the bat, those two terms, treehouse and frat house, are incredibly reductive and carry an awful lot of preconceived notions with them. Most of those notions being pretty negative. To start, be careful about the terminology used when referring to different groups of people, because if you have terms that carry baggage, that baggage is going to influence and impact your thinking going on. At the end of the day, Dragon Age 2 didn't really do a two target target marketing push. Almost all of the marketing was targeted at the frat house and the treehouse was largely ignored. There was nothing there for the core Dragon Age audience to sink their teeth into. So they were consuming that same marketing material that was targeted at the frat house and it made them worried. It made them think, oh no, this is going to be dumbed down for the consoles. This is going to be something very different. I'm, I'm very worried. I'm very concerned. No additional information was provided to them to mitigate that concern. So then what happens when the game launches? You get confirmation bias. You get people who are coming into this game already worried the combat is going to be way more action-y. And it is more action-y. And what I would argue is that because they were already worried, it actually amplifies their rejection of what they're seeing. Because the truth of the matter is, for combat, the combat systems in Dragon Age 2, it's the same under the hood as Dragon Age Origins. It's just the knobs are just in different places. It's basically the same combat system. So yes, it is faster. It is more focused on the, the consoles. But I think by ignoring the treehouse, by ignoring the core in talking to them, you just set the product up to be rejected even harder than it deserved. So again, am I saying that if you loved combat in Dragon Age Origins, you're going to love combat in Dragon Age 2? No, I'm not saying that. They aren't the same. But what I am saying is by not providing a path from Dragon Age Origins to Dragon Age 2 for combat for other systems, for the core audience, you're causing an even louder, harsher, more knee-jerk reaction because they're coming in worried and their worries are being confirmed. If instead we had had that second target of marketing, then there is the opportunity to at least bring them on the path to, to reveal a change, get their negative feedback, then reveal the reasons for those changes, and in some cases repair that concern, and in some cases paper over it, but at least mitigate the relationship and not have to deal with it all on launch day and have this incredibly harsh reaction, rejection occur all at once. And maybe with what I just said, you can kind of see the other major problem that I see with the frat house, tree house style of marketing campaign. The assumption made in this is that you can essentially make two parallel comp campaigns that are independent of each other that don't cross talk. And we didn't even do that, but that was sort of the thinking. But that's not true. It's not that it's two parallel streams. It's more that it is a pool of materials and different people will dip into that pool more shallowly or more deeply depending on their degree of engagement. So the treehouse, your core, they're going to consume all of it. They're going to consume all of the ridiculous metal bits of marketing that you do for the frat house, and they'll consume anything else that you provide as well. So if you're going to do something with two targets, you need to recognize that the core is going to eat it all. So that stuff that's targeted at the frat house needs to at least be not causing rejection from your treehouse. 
because you can't act like it's not going to be seen by them because it definitely will. EA loves their data for a year. They love their data a bit more. At the time of Dragon Age 2, so in 2010, the single strongest predictor of sales that EA had was pre-order numbers. There was an incredibly strong correlation between the pre-orders that a game got and the final sales that it got. And it would use that number as a proxy for how well is this game going to do? And I think there's some reasons to believe that higher pre-orders are somewhat causal for higher final sales. If you have lots of pre-orders at a GameStop, GameStop is going to think, oh, this game is going to be big. And therefore, they are more likely to put a standee up, which is more likely to get more attention. And therefore, you might sell a few more copies. So you can sort of see why okay, yeah, it might be slightly causal, but it's certainly not a strong causal relationship. But if your organization believes that it's a strong causal relationship, then you have an opportunity to really mess around with the numbers, which is exactly what happened on Dragon Age 2. Because pre-orders were seen as the be-all end-all number, Dragon Age 2 did lots of crazy things to try to juice up its pre-orders with pre-order incentives and things like that. And it did an incredibly good job of juicing up that number, which would have seemed to indicate that Dragon Age 2 was going to sell probably 10 million copies. But of course, that's not what happened because you can very easily break this correlation by fiddling around with the pre-order numbers in order to juice them up, which is precisely what happened. While I do think that pre-orders at least used to be, and probably still are, a predictive number, once you start using them as if they're a causal number, you're basically breaking their ability to be very predictive because you're gonna end up with teams trying to juice them up in order to get that number better because they know the organization is gonna like it better. We've talked about the level reuse, which I think is probably one of the, the weakest things in Dragon Age 2. The thing that, that actually makes me feel the most regret for Dragon Age 2 is the way that the endings go. So I guess spoilers, but you get to the end of Dragon Age 2 and you have to deal with the mages and the Templars. There's the whole question of the mages and the Templars. But regardless of the choice that you make there, you end up fighting both Orsino and Meredith and the mages end up going all crazy regardless. You've made a different choice You've come down on this decision in a very different way, and yet the game has you play through basically the same content in a slightly different order, but it's basically exactly the same content. I think that's a mistake, and I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that was my decision, but I think that's a mistake because it undercuts the Mage Templar question quite a bit. Now, the reason why it is that way in Dragon Age 2 is the games under incredibly tight constraints. Orsino isn't worthy of being an end boss all on his own. So the decision is that you got to fight Meredith no matter what. Okay, so that's actually, I think, defensible. You could say Meredith has been corrupted by the Red Lyrium. You got to fight her no matter what. You can still make the choice. I think the place where Dragon Age 2 crosses the line is that we also make you fight Orsino no matter what. And I think that's the mistake. And the reason we do that is it's content. We want players to consume as much of our content as we can because it feels like waste if we have content that isn't seen by a player. And I think that is a mistake. And I think that's a lesson that maybe video game studios are just waking up to now that actually it's not waste. Content that isn't consumed by the player isn't a problem, that actually you should want that. Dragon Age 2 shipped in early 2011. And I joined Twitter right at E3 of 2011. So this is giving me an opportunity to actually watch this interesting journey that Dragon Age 2 has actually gone on in the public consciousness. So shortly after launch, people are angry because it's not enough like Dragon Age Origins, reuse of levels, a lot of backlash. But over time, as we've gotten more and more distance from the launch, Dragon Age 2 has actually become the one that is fashionable to like. And I think it's because while it has many flaws, while it shows that it's been rushed, 
while there are some mistakes in it, what Dragon Age 2 does is it has a strong focus on characters. After we got out of the blast radius of the confirmation bias and the marketing campaign, the game was able to get a bit of a fresh perspective from people. That allowed people to see what was good about the game and not just see what was different or bad about the game. When I think about the box art for the Dragon Age series. I actually really like all of them. Dragon Age Origins has a strong graphical look. Dragon Age Inquisition has a good use of negative space with the negative space dragon, though it's a bit wonky around the head. But Dragon Age 2, I think, actually has the strongest box of all three because it actually combines both of those aspects. It's strongly graphical, it's got a strong color sense that stands out on the shelves, back when shelves still mattered, and it has a good use of negative space with the people that are in the negative space of the wings of the dragon. Arguably, it commits one of the big sins of RPG key art, which is that it locks the protagonist down to male, mage, hawk, with a very specific appearance. This is something that RPGs always struggle with. How do you show that characters can be different things while also having an iconic figure on the front of your box? Dragon Age Origins actually kind of gets around it by using Morgan, but you do kind of want to show the protagonist. So I'm kind of letting it off the hook on this one because I think it's something that is hard to work around. So the advantage of Dragon Age 2 is by using Iconic Hawk, you've got a big central character, whereas Inquisition uses a more generic armored character, which is still kind of locking things down a little bit, at least into the warrior territory, but doesn't give you that iconic centerpiece. I think that boxes don't matter as much as they used to. Cover art doesn't matter as much as it used to. But I think it still matters some. I think there is still an opportunity to draw some attention to your game through an eye-catching piece of key art. And for me, I really like this strongly colored graphical art piece that unpacks as you spend more time with it. I've alluded to this throughout this video, but I think it's worth spending a little bit of time with it here as we get closer to the end of the video. Dragon Age 2 is the forge through which the Dragon Age team became a true team. Both the leadership and the team itself really learned how it worked together on Dragon Age 2. And I think it is worthwhile to look for an opportunity to have this kind of experience as a team, if you can, where you go through a cycle very quickly and learn each other's idiosyncrasies, each other's strengths and weaknesses, and learn how to work together as a team. Would I suggest that every team should inject an overly rushed project into their existence in order to forge themselves into something stronger? No, obviously not, but maybe there are opportunities to replicate some of this advantage through demos or gate builds or something where the team can learn better to click together. Because what you find is that some of your strengths some of your weaknesses, some of the stresses on the team are only going to appear under certain circumstances. So a team that appears to work really well together might buckle under the strain of finally, because you've never figured out how to work together there. Whereas going through an entire cycle, even if it's artificial, gives you an opportunity to find those weaknesses and figure out what you're going to do about it. I think that you don't get Dragon Age Inquisition without Dragon Age 2. You don't get the team that understands how to work together, talk to itself, have disagreements with itself without the we must keep going, we must march forward, we must ship a game no matter what pressure that comes from Dragon Age 2. So I guess that's a positive of the brutal period that was Dragon Age 2. And I do think that there is the opportunity to find something there for other teams. Here at the very end, I'm going to do something that maybe I'll do as well for Anthem when I get to it. 
which is to say, what if I had a time machine? What would I have done differently? So for Dragon Age 2, I think I'm gonna do it in two broad buckets. The first is what if I had to stay pretty much within the constraints that we already had. And the second would be, what if we had a little bit more flexibility there? If we still have to ship in March of 2011, what do I do to help Dragon Age 2? First, and I think easiest, is to address the treehouse, frat house marketing. Make sure that there is messaging going to the Dragon Age core to mitigate the reaction that came out to the game. Even if that means team members are going on the forums and going on Twitter and interacting with people through the social media channels, find a way to speak more to the core so that they understand better what's coming out. Secondly, call this game Dragon Age Exodus. Just ignore the executive, call it Dragon Age Exodus, use that again to reset expectations into a better place. Third, don't make Orsino a required combat. If you side with the mages, have Orsino not switch and just skip him. Just have the ending be shorter in that branch. Very quick, very easy change. If we have a little tiny bit of time, make a second cave that's much more generic that you can use for most of the caves and avoid reusing the very specific cave that you have in Dragon Age 2 already. If you don't have time to make another one, maybe just genericize that one cave while its fidelity goes down a little bit, it's able to be reused more effectively. As we go into what if we could have a bit more time? So first of all, push it over the fiscal year. Make it ship in the next fiscal year, damn the consequences, give the game a little bit more breathing space. Now that we have that breathing space, reintroduce the open part of act one where you're gathering the gold, cut or simplify some of the critical path bits that are there to not throw the pacing completely off. Definitely make that second cave. Go and write that Varric lampshade dialogue about every cave looking the same that we wrote later to introduce it. So we're not massively expanding the scope of the game here. We're just we're just mitigating the issues. Continue the conversation with the core to make sure they understand why this game is different and why that's appropriate. If we have a bit more time, reduce the asymmetry of the combat system. Keep it asymmetrical, but reduce it so the combat system is a bit more understandable. Write the system that allows you to mask out the area maps appropriately when you're not using parts of the level, which helps the levels feel less like they're just re-stamped over and over again. But that's about it. Now that you've done those things, what you've done is you've taken Dragon Age 2 and you've fixed its major problems. It's still a very different game than Dragon Age Origins. It still doesn't have tat cam. It still isn't a hundred hours long. And I don't think you want it to be. I think you want to maintain this strong character focused narrative that's focusing on your followers more than it's focusing on the overarching plot. You're really just doing a few things to address the most egregious problems that I see, but you're not rebuilding the game from the ground up. In the first bucket, you're really just talking about making a few different decisions, ignoring an executive forcing marketing to act in a slightly different way or acting in a different way as a proxy for them and repacing the end of the game slightly. In the larger scale, it's really just about polish, one or two extra levels, and one or two additional features. Nothing radically different. So this video has gone on actually a lot longer than I was expecting it to. Maybe I'm just remembering more as we're getting closer and closer to the present day. If you are a fan of Dragon Age, any Dragon Age, and you've didn't play Dragon Age 2 because you heard it was bad, I encourage you to give it a shot. It's better than you probably heard and you probably will get a lot out of it. A special thanks to my members. They provide the resources that this channel needs to keep running. If you're interested in becoming a member, there'll be a link down in the description. It would really help the channel out. We also have super thanks turned on on the channel. So there's a heart down below there. If you wanna throw the channel some money, that's a way to do it as well. We're getting close to Dragon Age Inquisition, which I suspect is going to be the biggest one of these. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up because that will help this video spread to more people. Let me know what you thought. Let me know what you're excited to hear about for Dragon Age Inquisition. I will see you again soon. Thank you.